A very good morning to everyone. Welcome to the first dissemination event of the India Health Systems Collaborative on strengthening health systems through research studies focusing on primary care. The India Health Systems Collaborative or IHAC is a growing network of multidisciplinary researchers focusing on India and its determinants. The IHSC is built to respond to policy questions critical to India's health system and foster a well-connected community of health system researchers, policy makers and other stakeholders. We are delighted to have you all today at today's consultation. On the agenda today is an introduction to IHSC and a keynote address from Major General Professor Atul Kotwal, followed by the release of a special issue of the Journal of Health Management. Also on the agenda is a stimulating panel discussion on the key aspects of primary care in the country and the launch of IHEC's membership drive later today. I would also like to mention that this is a hybrid event and in addition to the participants present here, we have people participating online as well through a Zoom webinar. I extend a warm welcome to the online participants as well. May I now request the speakers of our inaugural session to please come up on the dais. Dr. Krishna Reddy. Professor Venkat Raman, Dr. Santosh Matthew. Welcome everyone. Our first speaker today is Dr. Krishna Reddy, Regional Director, South Asia at Axis Health International. Dr. Reddy is a cardiologist and co-founder of Care Hospitals and is leading the Global Learning Collaborative. Without further ado, I would like to call upon Dr. Reddy to give the welcome address and kick off today's event. Uh, <coughs> it's good to, good to meet after two and a half years, actually. Uh, after the first meeting when the IHSC was launched. Uh, Access Health, I mean, we are privileged uh, to have this opportunity to support the, in the role of secretariat for the IHSC. Uh, it is like uh, mother supporting during the initial phase of the child so that uh, it takes its intended purpose. And the purpose for which I think this collaborative began <coughs> was to see how our system, our Indian's health system can be strengthened. As individuals or as individual institutions, what is not possible is possible when we join together. I think that was the driving purpose for getting all the like-minded people, like-minded institutions onto this platform of the collaborative. And we all witnessed the power of collaboration during the COVID pandemic. The amazing discovery of the vaccine within 12 months of the onset of the pandemic is a testimony to the power of collaboration. Uh, as a voice, I think when people join together, because individually we may not be experts to understand the entire health systems. I mean, it's like having an elephant in the room and seeing each one seeing only one aspect of the elephant. But only when we join together, we see the whole elephant. I think that's the objective of this collaborative. And so far, whatever the health system strengthening we were articulating was to meet the normal health needs of the people during the normal times. But COVID has brought another dimension to the what health systems are supposed to deliver. That is how do you secure people during the crisis, during the health shocks. How resilient are these systems? Not just strong enough to provide the care, but how resilient are these systems to face the sudden surges in the demand uh, that these systems will face? Not only during the COVID, I think uh, we will be, uh, as I think there is a convergence of three things we are witnessing in the global world now. 
the war that is going on in Ukraine and its implications on the health of the people. And we are seeing the impact in Sri Lanka. The, whatever it's a remote impact on Sri Lanka as to how the children are unable to get life-saving drugs uh, because of the empty coffers. So I think, yeah, there is a, a convergence of not only the health, but the other systems and their relevance to the health system's function as well as their resilience. So I, again, grateful to be having this opportunity on behalf of Access Health to enable this platform to contribute to the strengthening of the health systems in India. I think we directly need this collaborative and uh, the topic, I think, today's discussion as well on the primary health care. Uh, again, it is uh, evolving so dramatically. What we envisage as a, co as a conventional primary health care needs a lot of discussion and deliberation and evidence generation as to what type of health care delivery is appropriate to meet the primary health care needs of the people. Yeah, I think this forum is, is, a, is a dialogue, a, a kind of a Socratic dialogue process of trying to answer some simple questions uh, by participation of the various members. I thank again and welcome all the members uh, who are present here physically. I understand uh, there are additional 200 members who might have logged in online uh, to participate in this deliberation. Uh, welcome you all. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Um, I would also like to mention that uh, Professor Atul Kotwal, who will be giving the keynote address, will be joining us by 11. Next, I would like to invite Professor A. Venkat Raman, Professor at the Faculty of Management Studies, New Delhi, and Honorary Director at IHSC. Professor Venkat Raman has worked extensively on private sector engagement strategies, demand-side financing, and performance-based contracting for improving health service delivery. Professor Venkat Raman will be giving an introduction to the objectives of the IHSC. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, good morning to my dear friends here and uh, valued colleagues, and also hundreds of people who are there online. Uh, thank you for giving me once more an opportunity to explain the objectives and the uh, the, the vision that uh, IHSC has been found with uh, India Health Systems Collaborative. Uh, many of you already know about it. I have spoken uh, uh, online uh, several times on this. Uh, but for the uninitiated, uh, uh, so to say, within court, uh, just to reiterate what we have been uh, meant to be, uh, if you look at the vision statement of uh, IHSC, it, 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 within quote, I say, strengthening India's health system through collaborative research. I think this particular uh, vision statement is uh, based on three major pillars. One is uh, research for evidence generation, for policy making, or for implementation effectiveness. The second is about uh, capacity building uh, in terms of young researchers or capacity building for people in the health system uh, area or health system research area. And the third is in terms of uh, you know, participating in policy making, policy processes, policy dialogue, and if possible, even in the implementation stage. These are, with these objectives, we founded it. If I were to make a very brief comment about the genesis of this, about uh, three years ago, if uh, Dr. Indrani is here and uh, Dr. Professor Murli is here, uh, three, four years ago, Niti Aayog had initiated the process uh, on uh, India's health system. At the time, a large number of us uh, had participated in that. Uh, an idea was brought in uh, that uh, why not we create this kind of, uh, continue this momentum of coming together of the uh, minds of uh, health system researchers. And it's been a journey since then to establish uh, this uh, uh, so-called with, with, with the baby steps that we have taken. And uh, today we have a membership drive that we are likely to launch today. And uh, we would like to have as many health system researchers as possible 
in order to provide that kind of impetus for evidence-based policy making or even uh, evaluating any program effectiveness. Uh, if I were to give uh, just an example, what's been our journey in the last few years, or at least about two years, we had commissioned two rounds of, uh, in terms of research, we commissioned two rounds of uh, research studies. One of the major criteria uh, of this research uh, funding was that it is an open-ended one, so there isn't any kind of a nepotism, uh, so to say. Um, so the second major criteria was that uh, the institutions, uh, however strong they may be, or individuals, however strong they may be in terms of their own reputation, they need to find another institution to collaborate with. That is another major criteria for applying for research grants. So we had gone through two rounds of the research studies, I think close to about, uh, if not, uh, I, I may not be exaggerating, two, two dozens of research studies. Some of these research studies have been published in the latest journal, I mean, in Journal of Health Management, the latest issue. And uh, today's session is uh, primarily to discuss about some of the experiences in this research and how it's going to contribute to the uh, strengthening of India's health system. Uh, the second major uh, focus area was on capacity building. Uh, again, to give an example, uh, with the Harvard School of Public Health, we conducted an eight-session uh, program on health system assessment, uh, you know, uh, uh, training program for uh, budding researchers. In terms of uh, dialogue with the policy makers, I think all of us are in one way or the other involved, but uh, we need more people to come on board so that there is a greater uh, possibility of this, within quote, the snowball effect that can have on the uh, leadership and governance and also in terms of policy making in the uh, various apparatuses of the government. None of this would have been possible without the generous funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I am extremely, all of us in the foundation uh, collaborative are extremely thankful to uh, Dr. Santosh and his team of uh, very uh, supportive uh, colleagues. And it would also not have been possible without uh, Excess Health International, Dr. Krishna Reddy and his team of people who had been a constant pillar of support for us. In fact, Maulik and Tushar actually uh, are uh, the liaison between us and the Excess Health uh, International. We have plenty on the plate. We have had mentor mentee kind of a program. We have uh, some MOU with the Niti Aayog right now, and more uh, likely opportunities to come forward. I mean, I ca come through, and I am praying and I am hoping and I am also imploring some of the people who are there online, please join us. This is not restricted to only academic uh, people. This is meant to be for wider uh, you know, participation of whether CSR group or consulting companies or think tanks or uh, you know, philanthropies besides the academic people. The, it becomes a force multiplier. Right. So we are open to such kind of uh, exchange of ideas. Some of us may have academic perspective, some of you may have the field level perspective and joining hands makes it much more as Dr. Krishna already mentioned about. Collaboration makes this entire possibilities uh, open. So with these words, uh, I hope uh, the following sessions would be wonderful to listen to and also the intense contribution that uh, many of the researchers have contributed to our effort. Thank you once again and I look forward to interacting with each one of you. Thank you, Professor. Next, um, I would like to invite Dr. Santosh Matthew to the dais. Dr. Matthew is the country lead for social and public finance policy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, India. He is a political economist with extensive experience as a civil servant within the Indian Administrative Service. Dr. Matthew will be talking about the role of development partners in strengthening health systems research in India.
Good morning and much gratitude to the collaborative for giving me this opportunity uh, to be with you as you meet after the, well, I can't say after the pandemic, but uh, making meetings possible <laughs> in the current circumstances. I want to start by saying that uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who I currently represent, we are committed to supporting you in your journey and we believe that the work that you do, that you plan to do, that you have ambition for, is extremely important for India. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we are committed to continue our support uh, in the work that you do. I want to build on a little bit on, the, on this aspect of evidence-based research. I'm not a full-time researcher, but uh, I have uh, been in academia, both as a student and as a professor for some years. Therefore, you will please uh, 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 you know, accept what I have to say uh, uh, with a little bit of you know, understanding and sympathy. Uh, because uh, my experience uh, has been that when we talk from the perspective of evidence, normally it is, red not normally, very often it is reduced to uh, an extension of what we have seen in the past. So questions like, has it been done before? After all, at the end of the day, what is a regression equation? A regression equation is data points that we have observed. We harvest sometimes noise, sometimes patterns in that data and we project to the future. All kinds of you know, mathematical functions when we look for a close fit and we try to look into that. But it is my firm belief that a 21st century health system that works for particularly the disadvantaged, and here I am having the imagery of that 70-year-old woman who is illiterate, lives in an area where there is no internet, and she does not own a phone, leave alone a smartphone or a feature phone. It, it, it is that person that I have in my mind when I would like to talk about evidence and evidence-based research, which is, I believe, at the heart of your enterprise. When you talk to or when you scan the sort of field, particularly in health economics or even in public health, it is my observation, I may be wrong here because, you know, it's not that I've spent 30 years studying the literature on this, but it is my impression, and I will, I'll seek to be corrected. The biggest emphasis that we have in the field is on capturing the pathologies that we see. India underinvests. The, uh, the 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 patient journey uh, uh, is a difficult one. Supply chains are broken, uh, and so on and so forth. In fact, um, if uh, those, uh, uh, all of you are aware of the Jishnu Das studies with Karthik in one hand and Abhijit in the other and a series of these studies. And then if you actually uh, go through, uh, so the Harvard uh, course that uh, Professor Jha and he have put together on quality, uh, he makes a very dramatic statement about India and he says, only 5% of people who approach the Indian health system actually get quality care. 5%. Which means 95% of the people who approach India's health system actually get care that is inappropriate. But then he explains it a little further. He then says that if you take people who receive appropriate care, but with that appropriate care, there is also inappropriate care. Then that number 
goes up substantially to 45%. Now, we can have a quarrel with 30, 45, 60, 70 because there is so much variation in India. There's rural, there's urban, there's interstate. In fact, he makes some dramatic remarks, not in the course in some of this, that the quacks of South India are better than the formal doctors of North India. I mean, very dramatic statements he has made. And also, that capacity building and training has actually no impact on, on, on what really happens. So, you may or may not agree with Dishnu Das. In fact, there is another study that uh, uh, I'm aware of, which has not been published, but some snippets of which are actually available on the internet, which again, the Chan School uh, at Harvard uh, uh, had done that study. I will not mention the state. But there, they studied five conditions. The five conditions were tuberculosis, this is why, you know, um, uh, childhood diarrhea, preeclampsia, asthma and heart attack. There are the five conditions that uh, they studied. And they found that the best of appropriate treatment in terms of the percentage of people who received appropriate treatment was actually in tuberculosis of all the five. And the number for tuberculosis was somewhere around 6.3 to 6.7 percent, which again reinforces the Jishnuda statement. The point I'm making is that if that woman has to get care who does not have internet and is illiterate, we have to imagine a new way in which state-led systems, led, that doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, what, 60% or so is out-of-pocket expenditure, which basically means that it is a private sector or whatever you call it. Uh, uh, we have to imagine using our research capacity uh, as to how a state-led system can actually deliver to scale and do it with sustainability. Now, if this has to happen, our idea of evidence has to be rather broad. Mm. Evidence, certainly, but evidence from different disciplines. Discipline of accountancy, discipline of economics, discipline of public health, Discipline of social behavior change. I do not know. But the point is that it has to be not just multidisciplinary in the sense that it is not typically talked about because multidisciplinarity is like it is I have my view, you have your view, and then you know we have a discussion and then we go away into our silos. Mm. It has to be first principles based construction of something that, and here I'm going to say something very provocative, that the political leadership of the country feels confident to get behind. If you look at the six pillars of, you know, primary health care or just plain good public health, I mean, what are the things that appear? I mean, people, I mean, WHO calls it by some other name, but in my head, what really is, is about first is finance, then you have facilities, then you have supplies, then you have HR, and then you have data, and then you have, you know, population health-seeking behavior and all that the population is supposed to do because, uh, uh, well, that's pretty obvious. Now, the first place where this breaks down, and here I'm talking from my sort of past life in the, in, in the Indian Administrative Service in the Department of Finance when I was Expenditure Secretary, and I've said this on many occasions, is that the decision on how much money should be spent on health is not taken by the health minister or the, or the health secretary of India or the state. It is actually taken at the level of the finance department and the chief minister or the prime minister of the country. That's where the level is. But when they look at the totality of what is being offered, and by the way, COVID has changed everything and we actually have a very small window of opportunity. So when they look at it, it's actually an allocation optimization problem. Do we spend the extra rupee on irrigation, agriculture, social protection, roads, civil aviation, or health, or education? Typically, the health secretary will come to and say that I need to hire 4,000 more doctors, I need to hire 8,000 more nurses, and I need to increase the salary of, or, or rather put the ASHA on a, on a regular wage and increase, I mean, we are all celebrating the uh, the recognition by WHO of the role that the ASHAs in India have had, had to play. But just look at the way in which we remunerate the ASHA. 
I am not getting into a quarrel about whether they should be on a salary or not salary. It's just that what today we have promised the Asha, in how many states or in what percentage of the people whom they serve are actually getting paid on time. In fact, they are not even, you know, getting paid for or they, in some states they don't even know that their in, their income can actually go up many fold because they're just in the 20 to 30 percent of the 80 to 90 things that they can actually get paid for and it varies from state to state. The point I'm making is that we need to have a conception of evidence that is far more expansive and far more first principles based based on what is it that we are trying to achieve. And in this, I believe that India is going to be very uniquely placed. And I don't believe that the way we look at the pathologies of the past or the way we depend on a Western notion of what works, because typically if you talk to Western scholars, they will tell you, you know, for example, you take the electronic health record, right? The first thing they will tell you is that it's not been done. The US has struggled, even the UK has struggled. I mean, what are, I mean, and, and, the, and the principal problem on an electronic health record is what? Is that the doctor doesn't want to sit and write the case record. It's a waste of time. Now, if you don't have an electronic health record, how are you going to get the longitudinal sort of analysis of a patient? And the way, I mean, I have read papers which say that uh, uh, it takes two years for, I mean, this is obviously some sort of a assumption, assumption laden, but there are, there are peer reviewed journal papers that uh, I'm sure you're aware of. And it takes about two years to double our knowledge of health, the science behind health, and takes 17 years to actually get it diffused. This is the, so by the time, you know, a person starts an MBBS degree and finishes it, what they have learned in the beginning is pretty much outdated. Now, the point is that if you do not build the electronic health record, and if that is not harvested for initiatives on quality, I don't understand how, of course we can, and which is to depend on what we have been from antiquity depending upon, which is the Hippocrates Oath, right? I mean, how, I mean uh, 1963, Kenneth Arrow talked of the almost impossibility to get health markets to function because of the information asymmetry between the patient and the doctor. But those of us who have tried to manage healthcare systems know that that information asymmetry is not only between the doctor and the patient, it is several asymmetries. Today, if you want to buy a car, you have all the data points that you need. Acceleration, CO2, safety, uh, uh, you know, uh, noise inside the cabin. I mean, I don't know what all you want, it's all there. Resale value. But if you have a, or if not you, forget you. If, if, if that woman, I mean, let's take a place called Buster, for example, has having headaches for the last three weeks, either she or the people who seek to help her, where do they have the information they need to make informed choice about which team is best for diagnosis, which team is best in terms of treatment outcomes, which team is best in terms of capturing the, uh, uh, the case history, which team is as close as advisable to standard treatment guidelines? Which team is as close as, uh, uh, as to uh, uh, parsimony and appropriateness in test diagnostics that are prescribed? And price. Not just in terms of what is charged, but what is experienced. Because some of the things that are free can actually be more expensive than some of the things you pay for because there are, you know, the, there, are, there are hidden costs you have to uh, incur to be able to get that so-called free treatment. Mm -hmm. The data points simply don't exist today for informed choice. So what do we depend upon? Brand. Apollo acha hai, chale jate. You know, or our social networks. We'll ask somebody we know, maybe a doctor, maybe a, 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 somebody who's experienced that kind of care. But what is that woman in Buster? Illiterate, 70-year-old, 
does not have access to uh, a smartphone or the internet, what does she depend upon? So I think there is a case for us as a collaborative to not to, to reinterpret the standard notions of evidence so that we bring together groups of people who are able to produce at this stage, I'm all saying is that imaginations, mm -hmm. but not imaginations that are, you know, which are, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, completely vacuous, mm -hmm. but builds on possibilities that are there in the different sectors that India has actually made progress for. If you look, I'll just give you an example and I'll stop. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've, I've already overstayed my welcome here. Uh, many of you must have heard of something called ONDC, Open Network for Digital Commerce. The way ONDC is being currently imagined is for digital commerce. Now, if you take the uh, passenger hailing, uh, the, the taxi hailing industry, before Uber or Ola came to us, what was it? We were, if you want to go from A to B, we were paying to go from A to B and for the taxi to return from B to C, which is where that person came from, or at least from B to A. So by harnessing the power of the GPS and the perfect memory of an IT system, it was able to give you certain data points which completely disrupted that industry. Now, if you actually uh, 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 look at ONDC, but then the problem with that was, and like you know, Amazon or the other digital systems, their entire effort is to build monopolies so that you, in, and, and initial days are all about predatory pricing to be able to build up the size of their market, and then to be able to extract the rent and not just profits from service. If you look at Google, you look at um, you know um, uh, 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 Uber, Ola, their entire if you look at where their source of, of, of profit, I'm not sure all of them even make profit, Amazon does, is, is that, it? I mean, as economists, it comes from rent. It comes from the monopoly access to data that they have. In fact, that data should not be a monopoly. That data should be a public good. And where they should be making money is because of the analytics that they're able to build on top. That then becomes the, the, the competition that is acceptable to society, which, is, which can deliver Pareto optimality in the way that we make, may we make choices. So the point that I wanted to make and, 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 and to close with is that this is not just about digital, right? Because making supply chains work, getting HR, getting government to invest, we have to, uh, to I think, it, thanks to COVID today, one can see an appetite for reform that we have never seen before. There is that willingness to, to invest. But believe me, this also shall pass. And if we are not able to show, demonstrate, that state-led, at scale, sustainable uh, healthcare, public health can be delivered to people in Bastar or Khagadiya in Bihar or some of the most remote places, which I believe is entirely possible, and I will not waste your time today, uh, then we are going to be we are going to lose uh, uh, the great opportunity that this pandemic has presented us, and will not be a true testament to the so many lives that we have lost uh, in this uh, two two and a half period that we've all gone through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Next up, we have a short presentation about IHSC from uh, Molik Choksi, Deputy Country Director Technical at Access Health International. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for the kind words, uh, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Uh, Venkat, Professor Venkat. What I'm intending to do right now is that Professor uh, Venkert and Professor Reddy has touched upon certain operational aspect of IHSC. And what I intend to do is to just give a more briefer about how IHSC operates as, as an organization. 
And it starts with saying that we, we do intend to strengthen health system. And the genesis has already been said that uh, it started So I won't go into who we are and how we evolved because Professor uh, uh, Venkat already had mentioned. But the thing is, this is how we operate. And we, we are secretary. Excess Health is proud to be secretariat. I am saying proud because we got an opportunity to work with so many health systems researchers. And we are able to interact with health system researchers. And even proud when I say is that this structure helps us in laying foundation for health research in our country. And why do I say so? Is on the next slide. When we when we get into research, right? The questions are the most important thing that we need to answer to. And there is always a discourse of disconnect between the policymakers need and what health systems researcher research on. We also wanted to break that particular differentiation of different question answer. And henceforth, when we started undertaking research, the most important thing was identifying research questions. And when I say so, is as follows. The first round, Professor uh, Venka did mention up two rounds of research studies, right? The first round of research study were on those questions which were unanswered by us research community. And unfortunately, I'm saying myself, us as part of research community, because I, was, I am still a researcher. Or during our NITI work, the health system building block work that we did from 2017 till 2019, but there were still unanswered question. So it was policy relevant question which were identified in phase one. And that became our first round of research study, policy relevance. The second round, when we started, we did not have questions. So how do we identify policy relevant questions? And that's a journey that we took. And the journey started. Uh, I think so, we, I missed that slide. The journey started, I, I'll just share on it. Later. Yeah. It later. yeah, the journey started. As follows, firstly, in-house, within Excess Health, we, as I said, the group of researchers, went through literature, past five years research done on health systems in India. And when we, when we look at those research articles, there are unanswered questions in those research articles itself, right? So we made this compendium of unanswered questions from those research articles. When this compendium got built, the research numbers questions were around 450 plus. Obviously, we can't address all the questions. Internally, then, because our core team, together within Excel, we have got a health system understanding of around 120 years together. So this 120 years of experience came together and identified, trimmed down those questions to around 160 odd. The 160 odd question then went out to the research community to prioritize. And we took the health system building block approach that we have got six building blocks. We were still kind of jacketed into systems building block, uh, not addressing what Santosha that health system which is much beyond uh, uh, health system building blocks. But at that time, the approach was health system building blocks and we identified six research questions from in each building block. When this six research questions were identified building blocks by the research community, we went to policymakers saying, sir, now ma'am, these are six questions. According to you, what are your priorities? They may be aligned, they may not be aligned, but it will be good to know from you what are your research priorities. And that's how two questions from each building block were identified. And that became our second round of research studies. Now, as again Professor Venkat said, no nepotism. The RFP went out to people we knew, right? The community we knew, 
and at the moment we are we are happy to say that we are on 800 connections and hope so that we get 800 memberships now but we have got 1800 sorry 1800 connections in this connections we gave them a clear outlet approach of how to submit proposals what is acceptable what is not acceptable with a criteria that you need to have a partner organization so a senior colleague fantastic colleague but you need to help in working with another colleague and that's where we wanted to exchange ideas and build capacities at time because a senior colleague may be working with a mid-career professional and that's also a transfer of knowledge and capacity and that's how this whole selection process happened once the proposal was submitted we again took it as an opportunity to bring health system research community together and the how is as follows each building block had two or three reviewers which were again from the they were subject matter experts so let's say well, let's say access to medicine we reached out to a colleague in isid who does research on access to medicine we reached out to a colleague in phfi who does research on access to medicine we reached out to a colleague in vallabh bachas institute she does on access to medicine and that's how we identified each building block depending upon the number of proposals access to medicine had two proposals we had three kind of reviewers uh, healthcare financing had got uh, four proposals we have got six reviewers so depending upon we created the technical advisory group which screened proposal and someone from the access health was consistent because research communities also submit multiple proposal right we want to balance that out and that's how without any kind of external influences this technical advisory group selected these are the proposals that can move forward and then we use the flexibility which access health provides in terms of contracting mechanism issued service contract uh, for all the colleagues uh, to kind of execute uh, the research studies and the reason i am i am sharing this today is that we are going to initiate similar processes in future also but for us it is very very important that once your proposal gets selected and the reason i am saying is because there is a legality to it your proposal is identified that we there is a potential of funding it the team needs to present their proposal to the core group if the team is unable to present to the core group the proposal doesn't get finalized or the contract doesn't get finalized and the reason i am sharing is that we had one fantastic proposal on access to medicine and as most of a uh, 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 firms lot many firms do that they conceptual thing they had a fantastic team but when we said to those colleagues that hey guys now present they could not bring the team together so for us if you can't bring team together you cannot deliver and that's where you lose on your proposal you lose the ratings on your proposal and these are something to be uh, shared right now because when the second round or the or third round or the fourth round comes this is how ihsc is going to kind of evaluate your proposals access health would be happy to be secretary in future there are capable people more than us happy to take on the responsibility and the roles but this is how we intend to build forward well, another thing that we want to share is on the capacity building right the capacity building also follows a similar approach the capacity building initiative there are many areas which are which need focus as far as capacity building is concerned how to prioritize them we did similar exercise we did training needs assessment amongst this cohort if i may say of health systems researchers around 1600 at that time now 1800 health systems researcher we sent them question as to say hey what your training needs assessment are based on the pop populated scores we started identifying people who can impart those training instead of reinventing the wheel right recreating the training curriculum training module we started reaching out to people who can undertake those research studies and in that context again the community we would request you to come forward right if you have got some training already built in there is a cohort existing out there who needs capacity building so let's merge them and these are some insights i wanted to share as part of the process of ihsc is concern and now i would like to request uh, upon uh, uh, major general professor atul kothwal who has uh, got bit delayed but he is kind enough to be here to get on the dais and in next couple of minutes we'll request him to uh, give his keynote address 
Professor Kotwa. Uh, Apologies for the delay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Um, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Major General Professor Atul Kotwal. Professor Kotwal is the Executive Director at the National Health Systems Research Center. He is a medical professional, public health researcher, administrator and educator with significant contributions in the field of public health, epidemiology and more, and has had an illustrious career having served the armed forces medical services in key decisive positions. I would like to invite Professor Kotwal to give the keynote address on the topic, Need for Strengthening Health Systems Research in India. Presentation to yes, sir. You got it? Uh, good morning, everyone. While they set up the presentation, uh, I think most of you probably would not know me. I'm the you know old man out, uh, served in the armed forces, and though, though kept on working at the community level and also at the planning and policy level. Uh, I was in planning commission for two years, uh, but somehow I've not been attending these kind of uh, you know meetings and all earlier on. Uh, but but lucky enough to be you know uh, uh, in my second uh, you know career, somehow I've, I've, I've been all now since last 14 months in the health systems, and uh, <clears throat> the my earlier exposure to the public health system of the country as uh, uh, my planning commission tenure of two years, and also as a public health special epidemiologist worked closely at grassroots level with the government health system. And how I got interested in, uh, you know, how I got exposed, my initial exposure was uh, uh, when I was posted in Dras as a regimental medical officer in 1986-87. That time no one probably would have heard of the name of Dras, which of course came to be later, later on, everyone knows uh, through the Cargill War. And uh, the PhD medical officer, after about a month of my stay there, came to me that uh, I'm going on leave and there's no one going to be here for next one or two years. So during my one and a half years tenure there, I ran that PhD, and uh, uh, my interest was because JNK government used to provide a lot of uh, medicines and drugs and, and, and diagnostic and all also. Whereas in the army that time, uh, we were very very poor as far as the drugs were concerned. So I was looking after the civilian uh, civilians of that village, and also the armed forces as such. And I commanded the lay hospital in 2014-15, and I visited Dras again. And those small kids and all were now work, someone was working in banks, someone was uh, doing a, was a businessman. So, so that, that's my initial exposure and that's how I, you know, I've been full, completely somehow as a public health specialist being involved with the government's public health system uh, continuously. I directed medical research in the armed forces also for two years while I was in Delhi. I was interacting with the Ministry of Health, then as even DDG later. So it's again a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting. Though it should not, uh, you know, that's why I gave a little bit of introduction of myself because one should not start any talk with apologies, but by now I can apologize for delay and for, you know, disrupting your program as such. But uh, that's the challenge in health systems, you know. We have to deal with such disruptions. And that is why I think we all are working together to strengthen the health systems further. Uh, without further ado, I'll come to my talk. Uh, could you have the next slide? Or do I have the control? Thank you. Yeah. So, no. Okay, someone could change it, please. Yeah. It's, I think you, you skipped one slide. I think two, th skipped two, three slides probably. Yeah. If it's working, then I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. You could change it from there too. No problem. Next, please. Something wrong with the. Okay, I, I can uh, recognize Dr. Nani Gupta here, sitting here, and, uh, and I think other, others I think we'll meet later. Of course, the dignity of the dais, I, I know two of them very well, and uh, we'll meet later. Uh, the, basically, uh, why research is important in health systems? Uh, I, think, I think it's an august gathering. I'm not going into what is research, what is implementation research, what is operational research, 
and and why it is important because i think we all know that's why we all are sitting here together i'll just come straight to you know that uh, we must our health system research must try to understand and improve how the you know the societies organize themselves in at achieving the collective health goals rather than looking at only the uh, you know the, the the small picture we should also look at the entire societal point of view when we're talking about research in health systems the other aspect is that uh, there has to be interaction within the policy as well as implementation processes so so uh, to contribute to the outputs and outcomes so that that that's uh, another you know the second important point which i wanted to flag that uh, we we have to keep this in mind when we talk of health systems research always instead of just you know looking at uh, the so called pillars of uh, health systems or block building blocks and it is interdisciplinary always so it it involves economics uh it involves of course politics it involves the society as such it involves the you know the uh, anthropology social sciences and and of course the, the 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 user end user also has to we should never forget the end user whenever think of uh, research in health systems the uh, comprehensive picture basically has to be taken uh, to 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 do to respond and adapt to health policies and consequently how health policies can shape and also be shaped by the systems and the broader determinants of health so you we all are aware of the terminology translational uh, health isn't it so of course here we are it is transformational our health systems research should be something which is transformational especially when we are talking of a collaborative we talking of something doing looking at the big picture it should be transformational rather than only instead of incremental or instead of only looking at few of the aspects the it should enable the health systems for building resilience because now in covid pandemic has taught us about the resilience of the health systems yeah you could go to the next slide please yeah and uh, well designed ev evidence based research of course uh, will you know with the overarching uh, goal of uh, national health policy of 2017 is one of the goals of uh, universal health coverage so now from now now actually we should look at those kind of uh, you know research initiatives when we are talking of uh, health systems research the purpose is to strengthen the health system eventually and of course it could be mid course corrections or it could be summative evaluation also and the strengths and limitations of the health systems should be looked at when we talk of this next please uh so it could be implementation research operational research i'll try to introduce something new of course um, you you all would have uh, would be probably working in that field but why at nhsrc since last one year we are you know including innovations a lot of innovations going on in the in, in, in the entire country we all also have you know when we worked at the grassroots level or even at the program level we thought of innovation innovative ideas but a lot of those ideas don't fructify don't see the light of the day they are just presented somewhere in an excellent powerpoint presentation or a small movie but then scalability replicability is 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 a challenge so if we built in research in this innovation from very beginning so i'll 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 share with you how we are we are looking at it so that's another component which i would like to add you also to think and probably give feedback also later on that instead of only looking at implementation and uh, you know the operational we should also look at evidence based uh, innovations into routine practice for for that you know that there there's entire i'm not going to details of that the innovation diffusion of any technology or any practice it takes a long time and uh, we all probably are aware, we are aware of the knowledge attitude practices the entire uh, it's it's not linear we have been working on it we have been doing those studies but eventually how much of practices we are able to change or rather the change which we wanted was was it was it acceptable to the community as such to understand that also from from, from uh, you know initially so so we have to look at the innovations from the community also instead of only looking at from the health systems so so those it could those be built into our research framework uh, uh, from very beginning i think that that would also help in the health systems research this i think I, these are the just text which all of you are aware i'm not going to read all this but just to mention that you know the looking at very clearly that the inputs the process and the and the, and the outcomes that donabadian paradigm of the health systems so if you start looking at that we all know what all is to be studied but the issue now is i'll give you an example how how we can go beyond only what is to be studied and how to be studied so in in the in the health systems as such next please so the aim as i mentioned earlier is the overall uh, improve overall performance of the health systems but here the important thing is the methods the frameworks and theory uh, many times we just skip to to you know doing something 
but but we also always must look at what is the methodology the health system research give us a lot of uh, leeway from the classic epidemiology as such so uh, i am one of those who got trained in epidemiology for 3 years one and a half years in aims one and a half years in jnu so but 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 uh, later on when you come to the health systems we have to many times you know uh, take the advantage of the flexibility of the epidemiology which the puritans may not sometimes uh, agree with that but as long as your methodology is sound we that's why we, we we can go for the mixed methods even within mixed methods the sampling strategy and all is maybe purposive but there has to be a purpose behind that purposive it should not be just purposive because you just wanted or you just felt like it so that way methodology is very important so that grounding in methodology is required at the same time you can then take some flexibility with your assumptions but that's where the framework and the theory comes in i think every health systems research must have a theoretical background to it and a framework of not only the analysis which we generally many times write the framework of conceptualization also so that that then only you, we will be able to include all the stakeholders in in our in our health systems research i am not going to details of this that probably we can have discussions later on just just to flag this important issues but just two of the important uh, studies which you all are aware but i want to mention them uh, these two here but before i go there uh, it's heartening to see that there's a over the years there there there's a growth and especially lot of articles started getting published in indian journals for health systems since nrhm came into being now nhm to run 2005 onwards the the earlier on the the research from the public health uh, in the uh, view point was uh, limited it was not looking at the entire health system rather uh, if if you uh, the the people like us who did md in 87 89 uh, we never spoke about health systems as such we we talked about public health system in the country and looked at three tiers of that that was what was taught to us so the health systems on all also started in india go people got interested and and started working in that and that's a lot of credit goes to the now what we call as national health mission next please just to you know highlight two important uh, evaluations which uh, which did the med cause uh, correction and and of course uh, you are aware of the award very uh, belated of course very very uh, you know uh, uh, required and very much required and belated award by who should have been done i think 5 or 6 years ago but the pandemic of course put you know more focus on the ashas uh, so so th this this study done by one of the Uh, my two predecessors, uh, uh, one immediate predecessor and one the first one when the NHSRC was uh, conceptualized and uh, at the time of inception, they they didn't look at you know the ASHA program. What are these are the questions that what components work and where and what, what under what circumstances circumstances, not what is not working and how they are working. No, so this is I think this is what in a summary what I was alluding to, alluding to earlier about the you know theory of uh, the framework and all has to be there. of course they had the entire framework but i'm just sharing with you this important things which is very interesting and much it is very significant for for the study and that's why the study was able to bring out contextually in those states where they studied that what were they doing and what was uh, doing uh, being done well and what were the circumstances to what extent and then they came up with suggestions how to improve it further because 2011 was the time when there was a discourse in the in the community in the scientific community that whether asha will remain asha will be will become nirasha because we were we were giving her so many so much of work so much of workload incrementally was being added and uh, even in 2007 8 when the planning commission that time we had to you know fend off lot of ministries which were trying to give lot of work on, on the ashas when they were initially we were at the time of initial selection and you know initial started they are coming into the being in the system so so here this this is a, i think one of the landmark ones which which we must you know read and see Uh, so how, and and led to changes and eventual uh, improved functionality and effectiveness of ashas next please the next one is jsy evaluation the conditional cash cash transfer scheme which which was built from based on the lessons learned from you know the south american countries and uh, but then of course we we modified it and the it i have referred to uh, by evaluation it's i i you know pulled in few evaluation results one done by international agency 3 4 4 done by the indian researchers and published in various journals so so this is what important why the, the thing was even when jsy was taken up a lot of deliveries were taking uh, were at home and incentivization only for the bpl and uh, this thing so study recommended that removal of conditionality of age and parity 
So that increase, and we all know, our MMR has now 103, and, and the institutional deliveries are increasing. So, so it, it, it has made a, made a significant uh, you know, contribution to the current scenario. The other example health system research is I just flagged down, which I think we can uh, probably discuss during our discussions and probably take learnings from there. Next, please. This is just to highlight that, you know, the, into the NRHM framework earlier, then in the NHM framework later, NHSRC has been mandated for this kind of task for the health systems. Next, please. And National Health Policy of 2007 also mentions the knowledge-based sector like health where advances happen daily, it is important to increase investment in health research. So investment is another issue that funding, I'll, I'll come to that later. Next, please. Uh, the, 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 the need for research at the political level, uh, uh, the pandemic, of course, has, has, I think, made it very, very evident. Now everyone talks about it. Earlier, the need for research, I don't think it was felt as much as it is being felt now. There were, there were some many, many positive uh, uh, signals from the planners and the, and, and, and the people at the helm of affairs. But recently, after this, uh, uh, the COVID, everyone realized there's a lack of research related activities in the health system strengthening. Next, please. So this is what, uh, you know, post, uh, not post, the, the learning from the pandemic, and we are currently also in the midst. The partnerships uh, have been established, are being established domestically, internationally. I'm talking about the government of India level. Uh, task force uh, was made for the pandemic, and uh, there's increased investments in health. Even the PM Abhim has got investments and uh, for, for research related to uh, health. The, uh, and under NHM, of course, there, there's a large push and a large corpus given to the IRHSS, which I'll share with you post this uh, pandemic, where, where, where funding and all now is, is there, and NHSRC has now been recognized as a knowledge hub. So uh, during the pandemic only, uh, the, we have started, uh, next please, we initiated a new division, created a new division in NHSRC, Knowledge Management Division. So that, that's the hub for uh, entire research and knowledge management for the entire NHM, and even going beyond NHM, because NHSRC's role over the years, uh, it's in the, almost becoming entire Ministry of Health, rather than limited only to the NHM. So uh, the, the national knowledge platform, if you, if, as you see on the, in the slide, 1617, that was national knowledge platform was formed to promote health policy and systems research. The, <clears throat> later on, this was during the pandemic, it was renamed as IRHSS, Implementation Research Health System Strengthening. And KMD is the one, uh, you know, taking it forward. We have identified state-specific uh, priorities based on a series of discussions with the, all these stakeholders. I think four or five meetings were held. That was before I joined. And uh, state-level consultations and also a lot of institutions were also involved. The <coughs> uh, we, we are also working as you know repository for the evidence and innovations and best practices. That's where we want to bring in innovations and best practices into the research paradigm as such. And collaborations, of course. Next, please. This is how the, next please. This is how it, we, you know, we have moved from the, uh, in the RHSS platform, uh, which is to provide uh, support to states through implementation research. And of course, it's not the implementation, operational research and innovations also, all are part of that. Priority setting workshops have been held. This is the committee. We have recently held our grant review committee, which I am now trying to, you know, rename as scientific advisory committee because we want that committee to Continue continuously monitor all the all the. We had uh, we received 13. Uh, pro next please, we received 13 proposals out of which uh, nine were found suitable to be you know discussed in the first GRC which we held. These were the areas. I'll I'll quickly share with you a uh, few of the topics to make you all aware and also to mention that we floated the EOI last year, and uh, somehow the response I don't know I, I expected a lot of projects and uh, we got only 13 and out of which four we somehow reacted initially only, and uh, nine are now under active consideration, out, out of which uh, two we have already, we have not, uh, the entire GRC did not recommend, other seven we are looking at how to strengthen them further, and how to include more partners, because we realize that we need more collaboration even with those institutions. Uh, next please. So this is what, uh, you know, the under um, uh, service delivery, few of the topics, you know, which, are, which we looked at, at the IRHSS platform, what are the reasons for ambulatory care uh, patients at secondary and tertiary level bypassing the primary health care? Because CPHC, as you all know, is an important uh, in, and, and important for the entire health system perspective too. So you want to understand why people are you know, bypassing this primary care. Uh, this blue color means this is a, we received a proposal on this. The black color means we did not receive a single proposal on these topics. 
That's what, uh, why do patients bypass the government and go to private? And uh, access to telemedicine uh, for um, reduce the foregone care in communities. What are the patient's perspective? And also correlates of neonatal and uh, maternal mortality. Next, please. Under the human resources, uh, next, please. So we, these are the topics, what are the health workers' perceptions of virtual or distance learning programs using uh, mHealth technologies, or do health workers trained through distance or virtual training program learn more compared to those who receive in-person training? The, the, the uh, proposal, we see two proposals for the next one, ability and quality of care among CHOs for managing common health conditions seen at primary care settings. So, and, and the third one, the differences in teaching learning outcomes, which is similar to the first one, worded in a slightly different manner. Next, please. Under the community processes, we, we, these are the topics, a comparative assessment of VHSNCs and mass functioning in selected states to understand facilitators and barriers. Uh, undertake an assessment of current workload of ASHA in different contexts uh, of the country to understand issues related to task allocation and uh, you know, capacity building. How do task allocation capacity building needs of ASHA vary in relation to current workload in different uh, contexts? And uh, in the, uh, what are the pilot models? In the urban uh, primary, landscape analysis was one which we are also undertaking, but we wanted more partners in that, and we got, got a proposal on that. And defining the roles of CHWs and HEWs in the urban areas, because that's something, even we, now we are in the, in, in the process of, you know, uh, revising the urban NUHM guidelines, because we all are aware there are several challenges in the urban health, and that's where, and I think we, we should also look at the, when we talk of systems research, uh, the, and there's a lot of, uh, the, the, we all are aware, difference between rural and urban areas and how challenging it is and how sections of society which uh, uh, need uh, this in urban, uh, urban health uh, are not receiving it and those who don't need they, they, and they, they don't want to, they will not visit. So there are sections in society who will never visit the health and wellness center of the government of India. But at the same time, uh, if you are creating and we are saying, okay, these are for those who require it, uh, we are giving a message that this is a substandard service where those who can afford it will not co will not come here. So the, the, this just I just flagged uh, one one challenge. Of course, there are many many several others. Next, please. In healthcare technology, um, we 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 are the assessment of effective free diagnostic initiative because this is uh, one of these. But we are very happy to see a, a proposal which also included free drugs also. So so uh, so that that's these two form you know as, as we are aware thirty percent of the OOP is through the private in IPD. 70% is through the OPD, and, and these drugs, diagnostic, and transport form a major component of the 70%. So, so this is another important uh, area. And what are the social, economic, and organization ethical issues, implementation use of various technologies in healthcare at various levels for diagnostic services, treatment of NCDs? We put a slash here that we, we, people could look at entire thing or look at some, some aspects, but a proposal was received which was looking at diagnostic services and treatment of NCDs. There were, no, there were no proposal for the vaccines as such. We, 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 we were also you know, uh, looking at that too. And how to estimate outcomes regarding treatment management in patient for the, uh, for the NCD. Next, please. In the others categories was you know, factors affecting treatment adherence for hypertension and diabetes in different uh, contexts. This, as you all are aware, at the IWC level, they are screening for five diseases currently going on, diabetes, hypertension, and three common cancers. So, and uh, there's an India Hypertension Control Initiative, which is running parallel to our NCD app, we we we're trying to understand, you know, how 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 what are the various factors and how to um, get the simple app into our NCD app so with the same functionalities without affecting it and and, and learn from their uh, positives too. And uh, of course, these are the other the gov in governance uh, the, we we added a topic, the improved cadre management incentives affected impacted the healthcare delivery initiatives, but there was no proposal from there. Ne next, please. For COVID-19, we added these uh, topics last year, that uh, community engagement for prevention and control and also role of intersectoral convergence. So we were happy to see, next please. So in uh, COVID-19, we received a proposal on understanding the role of intersectoral convergence in, in COVID-19 and the feasibility in epidemic preparedness and response at community levels and using evidence to develop guidance for future pandemic and outbreaks. So that's an interesting uh, area which you know, we, we, we thought we could look at. Next please. So this is what uh, we are now uh, going ahead. We are talking of capacity building, if you see at the bottom of the slide, and um, the research priorities, in-house consultations, the research proposals, working in collaborations, and health system research as such, involving all the states and stakeholders. And capacity building, we have already started. Uh, SHSRCs, you already are aware. So we have started capacity building with the SHSRCs. We've had three meetings with them and one workshop also for, uh, for them. 
and uh, we are reaching out also to them. And the states which don't, uh, don't have SHSRCs, we are requesting them to create. We have increased the budget for HSSRCs. It, as per NRHM uh, initial uh, P, uh, in the implementation uh, plan, it was one, la one CR per annum for the big states. And uh, last year I moved to this proposal. It took, took me about uh, nine months, but then now it is 2.5 CR per bigger state. <clears throat> so at least they can employ uh, H uh, uh, the HR commensurate uh, required uh, as such for the SSRCs, and also they'll get some funds for research. And, and apart from that, if they, if they need one, we already have, as I mentioned, under IRHSS. And uh, more and more states are now creating SSSRCs or revamping their already defunct SSSRCs. Next, please. So this is the innovation uh, which I was mentioning, uh, how, how to get this, how to ensure that innovations which take place at the community level or the public or the public health facility level or um, uh, so those those can be you know from very beginning uh, they can be evaluated concurrently and and research is built in in them so that we can look at their scalability and replicability and uh, so there we, we are now you know under the uh, previous pip this year's pip we have added the state innovation hubs so three states have already created this year others are sending their supplementary pip to ask for funds for state impl implementation uh, hubs the, the, the innovation hubs and these are linked with sssrcs wherever they are where they are not, we, we, are, we are looking at mechanisms, how we can you know, link them with the local um, Institute of National Importance or local uh, government medical college or, or, or uh, aims like institutions. Next, please. So uh, research priority, this, this is just a slight, slight repetition, but I think the, uh, we, what I want to flag here was the last uh, block on the, uh, on the, on the uh, first row. Reflection experience for, from field. So that also we are trying to, you know, get into our system and learning from there, generate hypothesis and, and further uh, look at, you know, research uh, priorities from, from experiences from field. SSSRC I have already mentioned. Uh, okay, it's totally ch changed. Okay. Uh, SSSRC is uh, uh, 12 are functional, 3 are not functional. But we are very happy that four states right now have applied this year to create new SSSRC. So, so that way we are gradually increasing with the aim of having one SHSRC per state. Uh, we are also having innovation learning centers. Currently, uh, seven are functional, including one tribal, and uh, five states are creating ILCs, and uh, two states, uh, one in JNK and Uttarakhand, we are going to support their, their, their ILC. So we are going to have almost more than 10 ILCs by this year, before the end of this year, where, where uh, in a district mode, we are looking at various innovations and learning from them and small scale, whenever your development partners or anyone else comes up with some idea, it's better to first, you know, uh, uh, try it out there in a research mode and then, then uh, learn from there and then decide whether to, you know, upscale it or not. Uh, next, please. So we, we, we are, uh, you know, open to, uh, rather we are very, very happy to work with the research institutions, public health institutions. We have MOUs with various organizations. Uh, this, uh, this is the completed studies recently, last one year where we involved PGI Chandigarh for out-of-pocket expenditure study, uh, AIMS Delhi for the uh, NHM uh, evaluation, and also uh, MMU study, uh, mobile medical units. In we Nagar, we we that study is ongoing on Ayush co-located facilities. IIT Kanpur, we worked with for the Ujjula Yojana um, uh, evaluation. Very interesting findings that wherever the, uh, the, there's a decrease in the you know, number of episodes of URIs and also other diseases wherever Ujjula Yojana was implemented properly. And they compared the houses also where uh, it was the gas was available and where the uh, LPG was where it was and the others which were still coal or uh, other uh, modes were being used. Uh, next, please. So these are a few of the you know challenges and uh, way forward. So uh, th th there are a few areas like in HRH, uh, most of the studies if you find they they talk of you know. Uh, how much is the requirement of HR? They all talk of the quantity and how much would be required. Probably we need to look more at the quality too, at the, at the um, pre-service training, that is the education as such, and then look at the, you know, so that's why we are now collaborating with the, um, uh, with the Novo Nordisk Foundation uh, through, the, through the India-Denmark partnership to look at, you know, the uh, quality of HRH uh, pre-service as well as in-service and also look at avenues how we can you know involve capacity building in a research mode first we are going to first do a complete evaluation in a systems based approach uh, quality again is another area where which is a neglected area 
uh, which which I think the from a systems point of view is very important to look at. Uh, governance again. <coughs> Uh, I recently attended, I think it was almost two months ago, Theory of Change uh, workshop. Uh, so uh, some of you would, were, were, were there. So there also the governance was, a, was, was is a topic where I think which is quite uh, you know challenging to discuss and also describe and also to learn when we interact with the states because there are a lot of uh, um, uh, stonewalling when we talk of governance with the with the states. But, but here we need some kind of you know, research in these areas. How, how, how to build up on this, that, that, that is challenging and needs to be discussed. One Health is something where when we're talking of systems now, in today's era, looking at the learning from this pandemic, that's also I think when we look at health systems, we also should look at the entire uh, concept of One Health and think of that. Uh, we need to have strengthened research capacity at uh, states, institutions of national importance, other research, public health organizations, and that's why a collaborative approach where we can use, uh, st utilize strengths of each other. Skill building, certification courses, fellowships also I think are required in this area without uh, disturbing their you know, routine uh, work as such. Uh, so th th that, is, that is important. Enhanced funding I've already mentioned earlier, which is a challenge in countries like ours where uh, you know, the uh, DES lab-based approach uh, is also gets published very easily. Uh, Community-based uh, studies or even people looking at, you know, the case control or cohort or trials, those, those are very glamorous. Uh, so health systems research as such, how to get funding for it, how, how to make people read more about it and aware so that, that, uh, so, so that more funding is obtained. So that, that's a cycle, I think, which we need to, you know, start somewhere. And prioritization, as I mentioned earlier, but in prioritization, we also should look at the geographical areas, the, the, uh, the, uh, people living with, in, with, with the vulnerabilities and also remote areas and building partnership or collaboration. That, that's, I think, uh, the, the, what, what I think one of the important uh, areas close to my heart. Next, please. So this is the last slide, the collaborations that, uh, you know, the, but for collaboration to succeed, the quality of collaboration is very important, where we look at all partners uh, with the defined roles and uh, with the defined uh, the, uh, ownership of uh, whatever they are doing, and also when the when the outcomes are uh, being you know uh, the the, uh, the deliverables are being published or being disseminated, uh, their their roles and all from very beginning. This 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 collaborative approach has to has to mention all this and uh, you develop mechanism for stakeholders and users. I'll, I flagged it again, which I, I think mentioned earlier too. Uh, we need to we need to involve users from very beginning rather than just uh, you know doing some research uh, for 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 looking at the health systems. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I think I'm uh, looking forward to the deliberations and also listen to everyone else and, and also the discussions later on where we can discuss a few of these. Thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kotwal. As Professor Venkat Raman mentioned, IHSC recently published a special issue on health system strengthening in the Journal of Health Management by Sage Publications. This special issue focuses on generating policy relevant evidence to support health system strengthening. It is an output of collaborative efforts of various stakeholders, including policymakers at the national and state level, academicians and researchers, development partners, public health practitioners, public health practitioners working with the governments, NGOs, CSR foundations, industry bodies and associations, consulting firms, IHSC, and Access Health International in the past one and a half years. As we release the special issue today, I would like to call upon Harpreet from Access Health International to present a copy of the journal to our esteemed speakers. Thank you to all the speakers in the inaugural session. May I now invite you all to take your seats in the audience? 